The more things change, the more they stay the same. This is The Focus Group. They're all business, except when they're not. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett here with my good friend and co-host, Mr. John T. Nash. If I could find, there's the screen. Hello, people. <laughs> John says I'm red. I look like I'm in a, a production of Dune or something, John. Either Am that or the red light district in Amsterdam Where looking at a girl dancing from? in a window. Usually I'm pasty. Today I've got a red <laughs> hue. Must be the time of day down here in Delaware, the land, of, the land that uh, got ironed. So anyway, welcome to The Focus Group. Tim Bennett, as I said, with John Nash. We're here every Wednesday with our audio release of the show on Saturdays. Find all of our media housed at focusgroupradio.com, including our podcast, which is TFG Unbutton, which is released every Tuesday morning. Sorry, Mr. Nash. Look at it. Are you wearing makeup? Somebody no. asked me that the other day. So you have a good lighting. Did you get a ring light or something? What did you do? You and I have the same light. That, right, that so Logitech. I, don't, I don't know why it's so different. Well, I use... I suspect it's because you could download an app for this Logitech thing and you yeah. can choose like cozy afternoon, bright daylight, like there's settings. And today I have mine on, since it's the afternoon, I have it on cozy afternoon. Cozy afternoon. Yeah. And it actually, it, then it makes the light a slightly different color. I wonder if that's why you're, you're looking you look, like You look fresh. You have no wrinkles or anything. Are you doing Botox? <laughs> you know, did I take that lighting. Botox? Did I tell you that Botox story that my dermatologist no. about that? It's so no. funny you bring it up. So uh, randomly, I said two years ago to my dermatologist, I go in for my normal skin check in September, and um, we're, we're just chatting. And I said, hey, I said, you know, I, I tend to sweat a lot in the summer. Oh, we could fix that. We could fix that. I'm like, no, I, I'm not saying it's a problem. I'm just saying, you know, like I'll put a T-shirt on, I'll change it later. No, 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 come on in. Um come on like next year come in around like may early may and we'll botox your underarms it lasts Oof. for three months did you get it done no i think that three, would hurt three or so four it's thousand a needle? dollars it was a needle, insane amount a needle what? going into your underarm they botox your underarms and he said all the celebrities do it everybody does it that's a red carpet blah 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 i'm like okay. really <laughs> yeah i saw a kid on youtube is that reno gold you know he's the mm -hmm. uh porn star he had his scrotum uh, Botox, Botox, but I don't quite understand what that was for. Do you know why you would do that? Maybe for sweating as well? I... Uh, He's a porn star, know, so... Tim, it could be, could be sweat. I don't know. I... No, I'm still back at people thinking I'm wearing makeup. I mean, I still remember the story you told last week when you were in uh, Chicago and you and a bunch of friends put makeup on and went to, I guess it was side tracks or something, and they had black lighting on, and you all look green? Yeah, we all look green. Well, this is, this is why I'm today. Look like This is what I look like. I was orange, you know, when we left out at <laughs> Healthy Glow. It was over there. It was around New Year. It was around this time of year. It was in January. Oh, you need, you need to have a little glow on you if we're going out. Well, we all were green in the bar. I so. remember in our youth, we used to like fret about this. And this is why people would go away in January and February to go to South Beach or something, get a little color, come back and survive the winter, and then back to your summer share, right? I remember everybody used Clinique, you know, wash your face with mm -hmm. Clinique. Pick, mm -hmm. it up at, yep. pick it up at Macy's or wherever you get Clinique. Ever done the self-tanning stuff? I did. I don't. I might have done it once on my legs or something, but I was afraid to do it. I didn't do it on my face. Uh, I didn't do it. Have okay. you? Did you do it? Yeah, I years and years ago. I think I used Clarins was the brand, and I couldn't tell. I just know that I had to stand and dry, like not do anything, not touch anything. It was it, then I thought, is this really like? I remember I said to my assistant Robin at the time, I said, "Is there a way to do this?" Oh yeah, yeah. You go to you go to a place that you stand in a little bikini and they spray you in a booth, and then you stand and you dry and you're done. Oh. Okay. She goes, but you got to do it every couple weeks because it fades. <laughs> I, I was always afraid it was going to rub off. I, I was never good at that spa stuff. I one time, the very first time, I got one of those spa wraps. Remember the? So yes, I went. I, do. I was traveling yeah. with Mahoney. We were we were in Florida at the Naples Ritz Carlton. They offered us this massage wrap thing, and we were flying though from Naples, Florida, into twenty degrees below zero in Chicago. <laughs> so this, so in the morning, this, so this 
woman that was doing the treatment, she wrapped me up like a jiffy pop in this foil with all this gooey, gooey stuff. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, so, and I'm thinking, I wanted a massage. I wanted somebody to touch me, move me, you know, yeah. like a back rub. No, she just wrapped me up in this goo. And let and you then, sit. And then let it sit for 45 minutes or whatever. And then she comes and she peels it off and it's all disgusting. And she says, uh, I said, what do I do now? She goes, well, you can leave it on. She said, because it would, um, it'd be nice to pull out the toxins or something. So stupidly, I go into the, to the locker room. Mahoney's showering. I'm like, what are you doing? He says, I'm getting this crap all off me. I said, oh, no, my woman told me, leave it on. He's like, really? I said, yeah. So off we go on the plane. And uh, about two hours later, I broke out in the worst, stinky, sweaty smell of this stuff all over my clothes, soaked my clothes, was disgusting. On the plane, had to get off, and we were trying to, like, we couldn't get in our hotel. We went, we were going to go for deep dish pizza. I was so uncomfortable. It was like wearing a slime suit. My clothing it was gross. So I never did that again. Never did one of those wraps. <laughs> but I think I, I should have washed it that off. You actually, like, I was. I was expecting the story to end with Mahoney saying, take a shower. And you're like, yeah, I think I'm going to take a shower. And the fact that you listened to her and kept it on, quite quite brave of you, actually. Well, I it's like, say. ha, 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 Mahoney, you're not going to get the full, you know, you're not going to get the full benefit of the of the rap. He said, like, well, he just kind of tilted. Well, okay. <laughs> I should have known better. Those but, are the days of our business travel. It's kind of like when we were on the cruise in Italy and you had suffered uh, a, a lot of scratches after that quad turned over on, was it Corsica? Yes. And you came in, you had the uh, the Polish ship's doctor had put enough, it, you look like something out of a children's. <laughs> like a mummy. <laughs> you look like kids playing hospital, frankly. You had, you know, everything. And then you're like, then you said really dejectedly, you can have my massage appointment. Because <laughs> there's no way you were going to get a massage no. with all those cuts and bruises. And they wanted to do needles. And I had to call my doctor. That was the one thing I still don't understand that everybody laughed at us like we were idiots. Is remember we went back to our cabin one night and they left pajamas? Or I guess they were sweats. I don't know what they were. I thought they were sweats. Each have- cabin, like, so Tim is talking about a trip. We did a shakedown cruise. This is something that Subaru would give to their top dealers. And so Tim called me on the eve of my 40th birthday, actually. And he said, what are you doing two weeks from now? I said, I'm going to have my 40th birthday. No, no. You're going to meet me in Rome. We're doing a shakedown cruise. So I bought a ticket, got to Rome, got on this boat called the Sea Dream. We each had a cabin. And in the cabin on the bed was a, like, a shirt and a pair of pants, yeah, you like know, sweaty, like jerseys, stuff. like comfortable clothing. Yes. Like we thought it was deck lounge wear, resort wear, right? So one night everybody's meeting up on the uh, on the top deck for drinks. So we thought, hey, let's wear our our official outfit for the boat that we for got the ship on our wear. bed. Exactly. So we both come out of our cabins. We're wearing these <laughs> pants and this thing. I think about it now. I think if we had looked in the mirror, we might have realized this this maybe was the look. <laughs> we, we go up to the top deck where everybody's having these like fancy martinis and stuff, and everybody. A ripple of laughter starts going around the deck, and then our friends who were with us screaming, they stop. laughing. They fell, remember, she fell. Chris yeah. fell off the stool, the bar stool, laughing, she was laughing so, hard. so hard. And she we're goes, like, and you and I are standing two- there. What? And you and I are like, what's so funny? <laughs> we, they left us these to wear on the boat. You don't wear them out of your cabin. <laughs> no idea. I still, I still love those pants. They were nice. I do too. Nice clothing. And I think it's because of our reaction, where we just were like. <laughs> More. because we were really dumbfounded like why are you why aren't you all wearing your ship clothing yeah. at the at the bar right i mean that that must have like and then of course we didn't we, run down and change we stayed up and drank no we stayed and we drank it <laughs> and i don't wonder if you remember on that particular cruise i woke up once on the floor we, we were coming into rome that night and i guess the boat was tossing oh, it was and, really rough, and i rolled yeah. out of the bed i remember rolling out of the bed and landing on the floor and i saw you the next morning you're like whoa that was a rough seas <laughs> Yeah, those are well, those were the good old days. But Mr. Nash, we don't, no longer we're on boat rides anymore, are we? No. So. <laughs> we had no, a good trip. now you're getting crowns and all. Now yeah. you're talking about dental work. <laughs> so what uh, what caught your eye this week? What caught your eye? Here's what Tim and John found. Uh, this caught my eye because we have just been out to Vegas early December. We went out to spell, cel- kind of celebrate Bob's birthday. A quick little trip. And I couldn't, I really just couldn't believe this one. Uh, So I put, the headline was, think twice before stopping to take photo on a Vegas, uh, photo on a Vegas strip pedestrian bridge. So, you know, if you've been to Vegas, 
the strip is kind of crowded and it's the big casinos and they've tried to make it easier to get around by putting these like pedestrian bridges over some of the major intersections connecting like Caesars to Bellagio, for example, or, or across the strip or something like that. So this, get this, standing or stopping is now banned on pedestrian bridges as of uh, about two weeks ago on the Las Vegas Strip where visitors often pause to take photos. Violators of the ordinance that took effect two Tuesdays ago could face up to six months in jail or a thousand dollar fine. What? Clark County commissioners voted unanimously this month to approve the measure prohibiting people from, quote, stopping, standing, or engaging in an activity that causes another person to stop on strip pedestrian bridges. That also includes up to 20 feet or six meters surrounding connecting stairs, elevators, and escalators. The ban does not include standing or stopping if a person is waiting to use an elevator or stairway or escalator. Clark County said in a statement that it's Pedestrian flow zone ordinance, that's what they call this. Someone must sit in a little office and let's call it the pedestrian flow zone ordinance. Isn't meant to target street performers or people who stop to take pictures, but rather to increase public safety by ensuring a continuous flow of pedestrian traffic across the bridges. The measure will help to ensure our world-class tourism destination remains a safe place for people to visit and transverse. That's but an opponents odd one say the me. ban violates the, the First Amendment, which I don't doubt. How crazy is that, though, right? That's an odd one to me. Why would Don't I see? Think? I thought you were going to say it was because too many people stop and it was the weight of the bridge or something, but that would even yeah, be like a problem, too. Yeah, like that kind of danger, like an engineering danger, right? But, you know, when you're, it's so crowded. Was it crowded out there when you were there? Some of the mm -hmm. sidewalks are so packed. crowded. Yeah. yeah, but people, that you know, you're on vacation. People stop and take pictures, always always taking pictures, and that those, those bridges would be great places because you'd have that, well, look at you, you have the sphere in the background of the photo you're showing, right? Yeah, I I, so, I completely don't understand. How no one's going to pay attention to that. Do you think so? <laughs> I wonder if they're going to have to give out tickets. Well, that's the thing. They're going to have to do that, and then someone's going to have to write about it or go to court and somehow fight it and go to jail for six months for standing on a bridge in Vegas. I mean, it doesn't. That's yeah, crazy. It's not exactly what I. I think it's a bad look for Sin City. That that's my take on it. But that's what caught my eye. It was totally well, considering minor. you can drag a cooler around with booze in it. And you're Filled offered with beer and ice and, into the Luxor, right? You know, and you got the guys with the car, titty, 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 you know. <laughs> and you're worried about somebody standing on the on the bridge and getting your picture taken. I mean, were you offered to go see boobies and boobies oh, and weenie when you were out there? There's a little bit the of cars? that. They, they've it depends yeah, they on the that time. Down of a lot. You know, we were watching. We every once in a while we rewatch Six Feet Under on HBO, one of our absolute favorite shows. And there's an episode where Brenda, Nate. Brenda, Nate, and David go to Las Vegas. Now, this is like 20, 30 years ago when they did the show. And Brenda is handed one of those flyers, and she starts <laughs> screaming with laughter when she looks at the little graphics that are over the, the, the private parts and the titties. And she's like, why do they put these cartoon things over stuff? I know what's underneath that. And Bob and I just laughed hysterically because we thought no matter how the strip changes, that yeah. behavior hasn't changed, right? No, no. And, you know, that's what it is you go there for. It's like what you lament about. You know what's happened to you know Times Square, right? Mm -hmm. It's no longer the, no longer has the edge to it, the seedy edge with yeah, the Howard Johnsons, yeah, and the, the dirt and the grime. Oh, the Howard Johnsons. Go in there Tim, and get a spready, go in there and get a spready Freddy and some fried yeah. clam. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, my my story. Um, of course, we always we always pick different um, different things. And uh, mine this week, I, I was uh, actually was sent to us by one of our listeners in, in uh, Princeton, New Jersey. And uh, he'd asked if I'd seen this. The headline is, it's time to hit rewind. And this was from, I believe it was from the LA Times. And there was a woman in California and uh, in Sun Valley. Her name is Alyssa Colgard. And she decided that she had a lot of these, um, like we all do, she had DVDs and and videotapes, VHS, VHS tapes, and so forth. So she decided to open up a free Blockbuster little <laughs> station out in front of her house. So if you're watching on the uh, video, you can see a picture of it there. It's it's a lot like one of those lending libraries that had popped up in a lot of neighborhoods. You read my mind. I was going to say, it looks like a little lending library. Yeah. Right, so she has a sign. She used a bookshelf. It's got a door on it, but she's got VHS, a VHS tapes and DVDs. She's also adding books to it. And it's um, it's a free, essentially, she's calling it a free blockbuster, um, you know, borrow and lending library. And uh, she said the nostalgia 
Um, a lot of people are returning to physical media. You've said this before. Um, and this says she works in the entertainment industry. She says it usually takes about 10 years for people to then want to go back to nostalgia and um, peruse um, handheld, as you say, handheld media versus streaming, because not everything is streamed or something streamed and then it goes away. So people like to actually have the physical copy of it. And um, so she said she had seen this trend happening in the uh, in the industry. She probably works at Deep Discount. Maybe that's how <laughs> she knows. Yeah. But she decided to open up this um, this little blockbuster, as she called it. Apparently, the last blockbuster in Los Angeles of the big retail brick and mortar store closed in 2013. But there's one that's still open. There's only one left in the country. So blockbuster went bankrupt in 2010, but there's still a store. Um, and it's doing quite well in Bend, Oregon, where you can go in and you can do just like you did and buy the buy the candies and everything else that you used to be able to do at popcorn uh, at Blockbuster. She said that um, in the neighborhood, it's uh, she has a number of great movies, but somebody just left off, which I thought sounded like a great thing. Somebody had just left all of the um, with with the uh, nominated twenty twenty three nominated. Um, screeners for shows nominated for the wow Emmys. seriously so she said those are very popular people where people have been using them bringing them back and uh she's also put up a little um little candy thing so you can get red vines or sweet tarts or something <laughs> like that as well and it's on the honor system you put your money in so you get your movie get your little candy red vines or whatever you're going to get licorice and uh and then move on so um yeah i thought it was a pretty cool thing for the neighborhood we had Tim a lending Lee's? library in our neighborhood in pennsylvania and um it was great. I thought it's a great. We idea. have two in our neighborhood here in the city, and I frequently will drop books off there, um, or we have something in our laundry laundry room we do. But that that blockbuster that's in Bend, Oregon. Yeah. Um, is it actually a blockbuster? Is it somebody who somehow decided to keep calling the store blockbuster? You know, what it's I mean? a block. It says it's a, it's known as the last blockbuster. I looked it up and. Um, they call it a franchise, so I don't know if, if it's owned by the corporation, but it's got the signage that has all of the, all of the the bells and whistles you'd expect from it. But they're they're it's 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 um, advertised or um, I guess yeah, advertised as the last blockbuster. In the I world, so I just funny. think you and I we remember going to the video store. Oh, uh, yeah. In fact, when we first got out of college, it was a cheap Friday night. You'd go to the store, pick up a tape. And you did have to rewind. Remember, you <laughs> make sure you rewind. <laughs> she said some people have not returned the DVDs. And the other thing for clarification, so she opened up so the book library part of this blockbuster. So she has the DVDs, the VHS tapes. Um, she's offering books that have been banned. <laughs> oh, that's so, good. I like that. That's so, good. so it has. So, um, and she says, and a bunch of other books that uh, over the years were controversial, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, uh, Brave New World from Huxley. So she's, she uh, had a certain specific goal with the uh, lending library. So, I don't know, that's a pretty cool thing. More power to her. I love that. And I, it's, it's strange to me that Fahrenheit 451 would ever be banned. You, you read the book, right? I don't remember. Uh, it's it's a future it's a future where you're not allowed right. to read and they and that's the temperature at which a book burns Fahrenheit 451 and so they yeah books get burned. <laughs> do you remember, you remember that much about it? Yes, I do because oh, there's also a really good memory the like movie an elephant. <laughs> the uh, the movie version of Fahrenheit 451 actually I think it stars Julie Christie. Am I right about that? I should look that up. But it's an interesting movie too. Um, well, what's, uh, what's interesting about our show today is, of course, I picked that as a caught my eye before. John had selected our shop our, um, our shop talk this week, so it, it, it relates a little bit. And, of course, we're going right into Deep Discount now, our friends at Deep Discount, which is a great place to get your media that, uh, what do you call it, tangible, physical media, John? Physical media, the tangible, the touchable. Tangible, right. So our dial. Doc dial. So head over to focusgroupradio.com, click on the Deep Discount logo, start shopping away. They've got a 4K build-your-own library with stunning 4K movie sale going on right now. And Mr. Nash, what did you pick for this week's selection? I have been slowly identifying films that I want to get in 4K Ultra HD. They often have a Blu-ray disc with them, too. So even if you don't have a 4K player yet, our TV is 4K compatible, and I'm waiting to get a 4K Blu-ray. Um, I've seen 4K, and it's like, oh, my God, it's like being in a movie theater. Um 
so I picked a movie that I saw when it first came out because it came out in 1987. I thought it was the wackiest movie I've ever seen, sci-fi movie. It's called The Fifth Element, and it stars Bruce Willis, Gary Oldman, Ian Holm, Mila Jankovic. Chris Tucker plays an hysterical, hysterical, he has a great role in this movie. Um, but over the years, this has really grown on me a great deal. The costumes, the look of it, it was. it's got this really great look to it. It sparkles. I'm. It's going to sparkle on 4K. It's, so I picked uh, The Fifth Element, which is a sci-fi movie, Bob, and I love. And I said to him, hey, we can add to the library. He goes, yeah, and it's only 1849 for the 4K. So I why don't you think it why, why don't you think it was a, what you call a daffy or goofy science fiction? Science well, fiction? It, it wasn't like the normal sci-fi movie for no. me. It, it, it was totally different. And it's just, they just... It's just one of those movies. Um, you know, in fact, the friends I saw it with back in 87, we were all like, this is the biggest pile of crap coming out of France we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> and now if you ask all of us, there were four of us who saw it, each one of us would say it's one of our favorites. Uh, it's, it just grew on us over time. Jeez. I picked something vastly different, of course. Fatal Attraction <laughs> on 4K Ultra HD. It's uh, based on Adrian Lin's hit thriller, um, and it starred Michael Douglas and Glenn Close. He's an adulterer, has an affair. She ends up um, terrorizing the family. And I remember how um, one of those thrillers that's well, not necessarily so much gore, but on the edge of your seat. And I have a, I think I've told this story before, but I had originally seen this movie when it came out um, in Philadelphia. It came out in 1987. And I saw it at an a, a inner city Philadelphia movie theater, which was predominantly African-American. And the part of the movie where, and I think about this every time I see the movie come up, the part of the movie where the, the where Glenn Close kills the kids, bunny boils the bunny up on the stove. Oh, I knew you were going there. I knew the you audience going. went wild, raucous, laughing, talking about rabbit stew recipes, carrots, onions, throwing in there, make a stew, going on. The crowd's going crazy. People are laughing. So fast forward, I take Mary Ann up in Connecticut. To go, she goes. Oh, I want to see Fatal Attraction. So I'm up there on a break in Connecticut, and right before the bunny scene comes, I said, "Oh, Marianne, I said, I know this has been going to kind of everybody's on their edge of their seat." I said, "But everyone's going to laugh when the bunny comes on." I said, "Watch." Well, Connecticut no audience, Connecticut audience, right? They show the bunny on the stove, and I hear, "Oh, oh my God!" You know, you could hear a pin drop. Meanwhile, in Philly, I mean, people were on their feet screaming at the screen. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I I think about again, you know, the 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 um, experience of watching a movie in a in a major audience city matters. A, yeah, it was hilarious. So anyway, I always think about that. But Tim, uh, Matt, I'm just going to do a quick one. Bob and I saw the remake of The Fly, which starred Jeff Goldblum at a yep. Times Square theater, and it was predominantly um, African American. And we're sitting there, and there's a scene where he is tra he's goes through a transporter thing and his fly his dna gets mixed up with a fly's dna and he's slowly transforming and there's one scene where he starts like fidgeting with the jaw his jaw and he just rips the whole bottom part of his his face off because it's he's transforming <laughs> into a fly and this this everybody in the theater goes crazy and this woman next to me screams she goes oh no oh no oh no you get out of there girl you run because his girlfriend was coming to visit and he and she goes, you're running now. And everybody starts screaming, run, run, run. <laughs> well, when I, I could not, we, we loved it. We couldn't stop laughing because well, it's, it's a level of participation that's oh, not yeah. quite at Rocky Horror Picture Show, but sort of close, right? No, that you're exactly right. Because Marianne, I, I, so I, Marianne, I said, I can't believe that this crowd was, you know, didn't laugh about the bunny. She's like, well, she goes, it reminds me, she, she taught English in China for a couple of years, as you remember. She said she had gone to the movies and it was Superman had just come out. Christopher and Reeve, yeah. right? And she said the Chinese audiences would howl in laughter whenever he flew. Like they wouldn't laugh at anything else was all subtitled or, or dubbed. But she said the only time they'd laugh, she said the crowd would go crazy every time he flew. And she never understood that being funny because as a kid, we Superman flies. Superman flies, so, yeah. yeah. I it's classic. Yeah. So what's the All new right, release uh, this week? We do have a new release, and I'm very interested in this. It's called uh, Special Ops Lioness Season One. And the reason I know about this is it stars Zoe Saldana, Morgan Freeman, and Nicole Kidman. But Zoe Saldana was interviewed mm, a couple months ago about this particular project. It was a passion thing for her to do this. She does a lot of science fiction films. She was in Avatar and the first two movies. She played one of the alien uh, women. 
She's played Lieutenant Uhura on the reboot of Star Trek. I mean, she's had an incredible run of movies, and this was close to her because she got to play like a tough military um, military person. In fact, I'll read the description. It says, Force Recon, uh, so she's a, she's a Recon Marine Cruise, uh, was recruited into the branch's Lioness program and tasked with gaining access to a terrorist group by befriending his adult daughter. To the consternation of CIA handler Joe McNamara, which is Zoe Saldana, and her higher-up, Caitlin Mead, Nicole Kim, and Cruz found the bonds growing too deep. So I guess she has to go in and kind of salvage that operation where they were trying to get into the terrorist cell through the yeah. um, through the girlfriend. But I just, you know, you show me something that says Lioness in the title, I'm down for it. <laughs> so Special Ops Lioness Season 1 on uh, Blu-ray is our new release this week. So just to recap for you folks here, um, Deep Discount is having a 4K Ultra HD sale. It's a great way to build up your library. And um, as you'll see later in the show, when we talk about physical media, it's a good thing to have your favorite films and TV shows on disc. Trust me, that's not always going to be available streaming. A lot of stuff doesn't stream. Um, I picked The Fifth Element by Luc Basson, stars uh, Bruce Willis. Many people probably know it, but I can't wait to see it in 4K science fiction film um yeah i'll leave it at that <laughs> uh tim pick fatal attraction you just heard us talk about the <laughs> throwing carrots throwing celery girl <laughs> make a stew and the uh, new release this week is special ops lioness season one starring zoe saldana morgan freeman and nicole kidman so again go to focusgroupradio.com click on the deep discount logo and you'll start your shopping journey and you'll help us as well. We're going to take a really quick break. When we come back, we have a business birthday and an interesting shop talk for you. So stay with us. You're listening to The Focus Group with Tim and John. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. Now, back to the focus group with Tim and John. Available pretty much everywhere. Hey, welcome back to the focus group. Tim Bennett here with my good friend and co host, John Nash. We are the focus group. Be sure to follow along with us. During the week at focusgroupradio.com, there you'll find all of our social media properties as well as our podcast, TFG Unbuttoned, and our, our other social media properties. Properties, Facebook, <laughs> the YouTubes. Instagram's a little dead, and Twitter's. Twitter or uh, X? X, yeah. Yeah, which we're not on the X anymore. But anyway, well, so, we hey, are, but we aren't. It's, it's yeah, a dumpster yeah. fire, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, time for our business birthday. Everyone does celebrity birthday greetings, but the Focus Group is the only show in the universe that celebrates business birthdays. So happy 47th, born today, January 24th in 1977, Chad Hurley. Did you know Chad, John? Did you know of Chad? No, and this surprise, this is, I looked at this, I'm like 47, he created YouTube, and he's set, right? Now, yes, and I remember the guy we had on, Jay Samet, the author. I thought he yes, was I involved do. with YouTube, or he told a YouTube story one time, and I couldn't quite find it, or I couldn't relate it to this Chad Hurley, but um, I didn't know if you remembered it at all. Because wasn't YouTube supposed to be something else other than what it was? It, it did, started out as something different, yes, and yeah. then it evolved into this. So so Chad Meredith Hurley, he grew up in uh, Reading, Pennsylvania. He actually was a, uh, they said he showed an interest in the arts when he was young, Became interested in computers and electronic media in high school. And he was a standout runner. He went to Twin Valley High School in Reading and uh, won two state titles in 1992 and 1994 for cross country, um, cross country running. He was also a member of the Technology um, Student Association, ended up going off to Indiana University in Pennsylvania with a degree in fine arts. Somehow makes his way out to, uh, to California. And uh, he founded YouTube in 2005 with two of his friends, Steve Chen and Jod Kareem. And Hurley's part of this and development of YouTube, of YouTube was he was primarily responsible for the tagging and video sharing aspects of YouTube. 
So that was in 2005. In 2006, they sold YouTube to Google for $1.6 billion. $1.65. Pretty good for a year's work. If he's still working, I would be surprised. Maybe he's doing philanthropy. I, do you have info on that? So, yeah. So it was reported in the Wall Street Journal that Hurley's share of the $1.65 billion was only $345.6 million. <laughs> and um, he also has some other stock. He has about 41,000 shares of Google. They also gave them money, plus they gave them shares. Mm. So he has 41,232 shares of Google and a trust. Um, before YouTube... Uh, Steve and and uh, his friends, it's it's you, you'll be able to pronounce the name better than me. J a w e d, Jod, Jude, J a w e d, Jod, Jod, Jod. Yeah. So those the three of them worked together at PayPal, and then they went over, and that's how they and then they founded YouTube. So um, they worked in eBay's PayPal division, and uh, one of the tasks that Hurley had is he actually designed the PayPal logo. <laughs> wow. Okay. So and then they went off to uh, to develop YouTube, and um, so they Hurley ended up staying on as CEO of YouTube through October 2010, and he was able to stay on as an advisor. And then they left, and then the, he started uh, on his own a company called Mixbit. Do you know Mixbit in 2013? Yeah. So it's uh, it does video sharing through and editing using smartphones. Mm, okay. So they say it's similar to like a Vine or an Instagram, and uh, it resembles, you know, kind of very short recordings. It, it you can only do a maximum clips of sixteen seconds long. But uh, I never heard of it before. Neither have I. It, it yeah. moved into Avos. So he took some of his fortune. He went and he got involved in uh, Formula One racing. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah, and that didn't last long. He uh, he he went to try to field. He was a major investor in a, a F one team, and uh, in Formula One in twenty ten, and uh, ended up the team. He dismissed all the personnel and shut the team down. And uh, he will not comment on the team's failure to make it even <laughs> to the grid. So that that had to be a pretty expensive uh, boondoggle. Boondoggle. Yeah. He also has investments in, um, he has a minority ownership in the Golden State Warriors, the NBA team, also the soccer team of Los Angeles. He also um, is a minor or minority investor in Leeds United, which is uh, part of the English Premier League and uh, in the UK. He was married to Kathy Clark, who was a daughter of the entrepreneur James Clark. They divorced in 2012 and he remarried. Um, his current wife's name is Elise Walden. So, but it doesn't say too much more what he's doing. He does some consulting and investing, John. Goes to sporting events. Wow. 47. And he just turned 47. Yeah. So in uh, 2010, when he was stepping down as being advisor and CEO, what was he like, you know, 35? Well, 10, year, 10 30, years ago. Well, 34 or something like that. Think about that, right? Yeah. Because he, that was 14 years ago. So I don't know why we couldn't have come up with YouTube. <laughs> we should have come up with Facebook. Because when we were all in college, everybody had a little book with faces in it, right? It we, never had book. That. we never had that. You didn't have that. that? No. Binghamton was much bigger than Marietta. But you guys didn't have a little directory with all the freshmen's pictures and everything? Look we book? had names and numbers, but not pictures. No, no. pictures. Oh, see. This and I think that's, see, you, you hit on something there with Facebook that I think is interesting. You had to be in an environment where that kind of thing existed to have the idea triggered, right? Yeah, I guess so. I guess so. I don't know. I just, you know. I see some of these things. I can't imagine in one year that Google would go pay $1.6 billion for this thing. Back in 2005. Think about that. And, and back then, video on the internet was like, I don't know, it was like a close and play record. Remember how tiny it was? And yeah. It, you had to and have, it, like... it started and stopped and, you know, mm -hmm. still a pain in the ass. I, my problem with, with YouTube lately is all the interruptions with the... with the uh, Commercials? Commercials. Yeah. Do you pay to get it? Not Do you pay not to do that? I don't that? bother. No. I, I'll sit through a commercial. And a lot of the videos that I watch, like there are a lot of how-tos, like how to do this or how to take right. the brakes or the pedals off your bike. They actually don't have brakes because they don't have that kind of viewership. It's when right. a video starts getting people watching it, that's when they start dropping stuff in. Wow. Yeah. So happy birthday to Chad Hurley. Maybe maybe we'll see him do something else again. You know, once you or do not. YouTube, what else are you going to do? Yeah, nothing <laughs> to do now. Enjoy your money. 
So, hey, we um, our shop talk today, as John mentioned, um, and ironically, because since our our, our uh, partner here, Deep Discount, as well as the shop talk that I or the uh, caught my eye that I picked, which was re um, revolved around physical seems media. like a theme. See, it was a theme this week. You didn't even know it. So, that John had found this shop talk is what's the value of three million LPs in a digital world? And um, prior to the show, John and I were talking about it, and. It, um, you know, essentially, as John said, is that it's important, I, I guess, these, um, what was shocking to me about this, I assumed that anything of value that was done, I'll just make a big generalized statement, in the United States, particularly within media or entertainment, was housed at the Smithsonian. I thought all that stuff went to the Smithsonian, you took the best records, the best recordings, the best books, all that sort of thing. And that's apparently not the case, right? Um, you have a good point there. Uh, people do donate things to the Smithsonian. The Library of Congress is actually where a lot of this stuff ends up. But okay. the Library of Congress, I think they only admit certain things, like um, 10 films a year or whatever, and it's the film version that was shown in theaters the whole bit. So I would imagine the Library of Congress would be, uh, at least for motion pictures and probably for music as well, would be the the one, unless somebody had a unique collection that the Smithsonian would be interested in. But um, as Tim was saying, it's like we live with Kindle, we live with Netflix, HBO, Hulu, and this article says even the Criterion collection is online now. <laughs> even. And it says cultural archives now live on server farms, so much so that the value of physical media seems ever shifting. The interesting thing about this article, so basically this is about an organization called Archive, A-R-C-H-I-V-E, ARC, or R ARC, is a, it's in New York City, or started in New York City, um, and it houses close to 3 million recordings, uh, 78s all the way up to 45s and uh, LPs and 33, you know, the our, our normal LP. Right. And... Um, 78 is not so much. The archive seems to be dedicated to recording from 45s forward, but they did this because very little um, people just didn't save this stuff. Some of the original recording masters are hard to find. They would press a disc or a record and then it would go out of fashion and would be thrown away later. And it has this thing, the ARC uh, collection, the Archive of Contemporary Music, has the personal holdings of collectors like the uh, Keith Richards of the Rolling Stones, businessman Zero Freitas, late director Jonathan Demme, surprising to me, and A-Square record label founder G. Polland. Um, and, it, and it ranges, and people like David Byrne have donated to it, and uh, I'm going to scroll down here to something um, about the board of directors, <laughs> or, the, or, or the board. Um, it says here, musicians share the enthusiasm for preservation. No other organization is doing what the ARC is doing. It says B-52's frontman, Fred Schneider. Thank you, Fred. He sits on the institution's board of advisors, along with Nal Rogers, Todd Rundgren, Martin Scorsese, and Paul Simon. Wow. Saying he's been a record nut all his life. Schneider adds that part of the reason he sees value in the museum is because of what's not on streaming services. And that actually was the key to this article, was that almost 90% of what we see and listen to, or have listened to and seen in the past, is not available on streamers. So if Fred Schneider like, wants to preserve, I think, Tim, we have to line up behind him, right? Well, it's interesting. You know, our, our friend Brian from Admark, he... Uh, had bought a house in this neighborhood, and there was a, a gentleman there who claimed to have had every single album essentially made since the 40s in this huge warehouse. And he couldn't find anybody, and there was a beautifully cataloged, apparently. It was cataloged? It, cataloged and in great shape. <sighs> okay. And uh, he worked in, this guy worked in the music industry, but he, he started as a, a younger kid, um, after World War II, he just started collecting, 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 and really said he had the most vast collection. And they could not, I don't know if it's because it was so large, but I thought one of the big universities might take it. They had reached out to some of the larger schools and, you know, University of Pennsylvania and, 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 and some of these other places, uh, Penn State, that they thought might take this collection. Nobody wanted it. Amazing. And I was shocked by it because I thought, who would possibly have, if in fact, you know, maybe they thought he was blowing smoke, but... It took, it, it was, I forget how many thousands of square feet this, this uh, archive took up. But I guess the other issue, Brian said that while people may, were somewhat interested, they didn't have the space. 
Okay, so one of the reasons this article came up in Wired is ARC is looking for someone to step forward. They they are housed in a uh, place upstate, and the building this physical library is in. What upstate New been, York? Yeah, it's been zoned yeah. for. It started ARC started here in the city. I think that's where the offices are, but the ar- archive itself is upstate, and the building that they're in was zoned for um, agricultural use, and it can't be changed, and they have to mm-hmm. move the collection. Someone stepped up with a million bucks. I think it's a, a donor stepped up, but they're looking for one or two other people to kind of put that kind of money into this to get a, a permanent home. And in the article later on, he he goes into something that I've I've been very very aware of ever since we've gone digital. Um, I I'll I'll set it up this way. Years ago, I went to a um, a discussion that an executive from Kodak was was doing because Kodak was trying to make the very difficult shift. They were a physical company. I mean, they you right. took they had negatives and prints and uh, you know processors. And he holds up a four by five negative, and he said, "I could look, th- I could hold this up, and I can say to you, it's a picture of a barn by the side of a road, even if it's the negative." He holds up a CD-ROM. He said, "I have no idea what's on here. It needs to be encoded and decoded to figure that out." And to that point, in the article, there's a an interesting thing where one of the founders of this, uh, the ARC, says, vinyl records are likely to always be playable, but as tech companies come and go, access to a lot of digital archives can feel precarious. He said, we joke with the people at the Internet Archive about what's who's going to last longer, and we're all pretty sure it's us, <laughs> George Gibbs. If you've got a bicycle wheel, a rubber band, a bundle of sewing needles, and a cone of paper, you'll always be able to play an LP but you can't make a chip at home. And and this is one of the reasons why I think this is so important is he has a point. I mean, analog media, a record is just, you know, right. ridges on a piece of vinyl that as it spins, the needle goes across it. If you don't have a CD player and there's no electricity, the thing's just a useless hunk of junk, right? Well, you and I've had that discussion that we have all this media on some of this old Apple technology. Mm-hmm. And we'd like to be able to access the music, but you're afraid you plug it in, it's either going to delete it or you're just not going to get access to it. And I've wondered about that because you and I have spent a lot of money over the years on music, let alone DVDs and other things. But how do you access that 10 years from now? Is it going to be obsolete yeah. because I've got it on a, on a, you know, a stick? And one of the and, and going back to Fred Schneider being on their board, uh, he commented that one of the things he loves about physical albums and 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 even CDs to some degree, liner notes, the booklet oh, yeah. that came with it, describing the musicians that might have been on the session, um, what was the inspiration. It's all lost when it's digital. You download one song, it gets lost in your library. You play it for a while and you forget about it. I don't know. I think this is kind of important. I really do. And. Um, it's like if you if you've ever gone to like a museum, a modern art museum, and you've seen artwork that's like video based or something. I've often, if if I happen to know people who are in archive, if they're archivists, there's a whole world of people who try to keep old machines running because some right. artwork is done like on a VHS or a Betamax or something like that. But it's going to get lost someday because we don't have the technology to play it back. Right. And a record is just the most, a book is another example. You don't need to plug it in. You don't need to charge it. You don't need to download anything. You open a book, right? <laughs> so records and books, you know. Well, I even remember in an, one of the offices I'd, I had worked in that as computers were coming, they, they still felt um, it was difficult to do type A envelope. So they yeah. had an old typewriter in the corner just for envelopes. Just for envelopes, yeah. Because they they, they couldn't figure out how they, now I guess you I can can't print even them. T- but yeah. I still I still have trouble doing that. I I was just going to say I can't tell you how many times the envelope jams or, yeah. or goes through crooked. And I said I often say to myself I just wish I had an old royal typewriter. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. You you need yeah. a ding. <laughs> well, good story, Mister Nash. The importance of archiving and keeping some of that uh, physical physical media. Well, whenever uh, we talk about deep discount, I, I don't mean to sound like a shill here, but I'm not kidding when I say if you have a show that you love, yeah. don't assume it's going to be on a streamer forever. I think it's it's one of the... Re- Bob and I went through our CD and DVD collection when we moved uptown to our new apartment. We just went through the DVDs again and we, were, we pulled out... <laughs> you're going to love this because it's hard to find these days. Little Britain. Oh, yes, you can't find it. Yeah, you wait another it. couple of years, they're not going to be making Little Britain anymore no. because according to a lot of people, it's cringeworthy and there's a lot of non-PC humor in there. Um, Catherine Tate, another example, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, uh, Tracy Takes On. Remember Tracy Takes On with yeah. Ruby Romaine? You'll have to set up a little lending library down in, in, your, uh, <laughs> in your lobby of your complex. 
Yeah, I, but like the l- woman in California, some things will not come back, right? You, you put so? them out there and people will keep it. <laughs> Make a couple pennies and some Twizzlers yeah. and Red Vines and Sour Patch Kids and popcorn. <laughs> so I, I guess this, this sum, we can sum up the theme of this show as we're showing our age because of our love of old physical media. <laughs> but there's a reason for it, folks. It still writers, works. watches, Rolodex. <laughs> Betamax, VHS. Sharpies, <laughs> staplers. White out. <laughs> <laughs> we want to th- okay well we want to thank you for uh, spending time with us here on the focus group focusgroupradio.com is our url you can visit that site and go to and when you're there check out the deep discount logo and click on that and you'll go to the deep discount site which we highly approve of it's a 4k uh, hd library builder sale if you have some of favorite movies that you might want on 4k and i highly recommend that you can do that i picked the fifth element uh tim picked Fatal Attraction. <laughs> and there's a good story, so you can rewind in there. And the movie this week, the new release this week, is Special Ops Lioness Season 1 on Blu-ray. That stars one of my favorites, Zoe Saldana. So we like to say here, folks, don't text and drive, arrive alive, uh, especially in this bad weather. And we'll see you in the new week. It's The Focus Group with Tim Bennett and John Nash. Accessible on all platforms. Subscribe, like, and rate us on your platform of choice. Learn more at focusgroupradio.com. That was a stunning focus group.